Hello everybody and welcome to tier 3 part 2 of the film fan theories iceberg. Thank you everybody so much for 150 subscribers and for all the support, I really appreciate it. And yeah, not much more to say apart from thank you. Uh, let's jump right in. Jesus was an engineer in Prometheus. So basically in Prometheus there are these things called the engineers which are these tall pale figures and because people think as well as the themes of the film being that of destruction and creation, people think that uh, Jesus was an engineer or the other way around uh, and actually uh, yeah was one of those creatures. The idea that that's the case that the engineers were created or influenced human life on earth is basically central and one of the main parts of the plot of the film so it would actually make sense that he was the creator of human life aka jesus so yeah i've not seen prometheus but this this one's really interesting and uh, you know given the the themes of the film it would make a lot of sense and, and a lot like wally is evil the the mirroring of you know creation of life and these biblical themes it would make a lot of sense so it's definitely very credible you know lots of things you know lots of theories is difficult to say 100 percent if that's what was intended if that's what was meant by it but we know ridley scott is very good at having these layered themes and also his characters and his the people and things that he creates uh meaning more than than that and i think he was he's also actually a fan of kubrick i might be wrong but it's it's interesting how people who are fans of kubrick uh tend to have that more you know have the layers more uh in depth within the film within the films that he creates at least. Aladdin is in the post-apocalyptic future. So we can sort of see the dilapidated nature, dilapidated, dilapidated, dilapidated. No, it's gotta be dilapidated. It looks very, I don't know how to describe it, apocalyptic. It just looks apocalyptic. Uh, and given the, the sort of quite modern contemporary references that are made, people think that essentially the theory is it's in the post-apocalyptic future, which would make a lot of sense. And that's really it in terms of like evidence, the isolation and the modern pop culture references is all we really have to, to jump off from. But obviously that could easily just be, well, you know, I mean, Robin Williams, rest in peace. Um, bless him. Uh, that's just him doing his usual riffs, and and it is pretty funny to to sort of d to merge this older um, time with with modern references. You know, we saw it in like A Knight's Tale, where they were singing "We Will Rock You." Stuff like that is quite funny, and I just really don't think it has anything to do with the setting of the film, but it's one of those that's like not, doesn't have much evidence, but it's still interesting to think about when you're watching it or just think about it in general. Toy Story 3 is an allegory for the Holocaust. Now this one, we're starting to get really, really deep here into these really f messed up, fucked up uh, theories that are like, you know, it, 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 they give you a bit of a ooh uh, sort of vibe um, and this is for certain one of those. If you go through the entire plot and story of Toy Story 3 you can notice a lot of things that actually and I'll, I'll link the reddit post that outlines this exact thing a lot of things that replicate that time period and, and uh, like big events that happened. So Andy leaves for college which could be the beginning of World War II, right? Woody and his friends decide to go to the attic, like Anne Frank. They're shipped to Sunnyside Daycare instead. Does that sound anything? Like, I don't know, a concentration camp. And they end up heading straight for an incinerator, which we know, you know, Hitler did have things like that. They, he did have uh, these giant, basically ovens that he put the poor jewish people in or that it, that can be interpreted interpreted um interpreted as a gas chamber and they're rescued just in time by the green aliens which would be the allied forces they then are given a new home where they're promised safety and stability which would be israel i don't know who's what perspective that is for for which country in the war but 
I mean, the similarities similarities there, and the, there's quite this. It's just this really different vibe to Toy Story 3 that I've always not really noticed. But just it's so creepy compared to. Well, to be fair, like Toy Story, I think it was a Toy Story 2 when there are those. You know, there's the kid that looks like I think it was his name Will Poulter from Guardians of the Galaxy 3 and Midsummer. There's that kid that edgy kid who like has mashed together all the toys there's stuff like that that's really creepy uh in the films but they're just it's, uh, it's more like the th things that happen that are creepy in one and two whereas toy story 3 the whole vibe of it is just very uncanny very very uncanny is is how i describe it and i've never really thought about it but this one really makes me think about it now obviously this could easily be just a narrative way to tell a story to have all these quarrels happening and someone's you know put it together and gone oh well it's like world war three so it's like it's about the holocaust um which is definitely that could be the case and basically is the case because there's no direct evidence but it's an interesting way to write off that eeriness uh, that that toy story 3 evokes the blair witch murder theory I'm just gonna sound like uh, I'm not a filmmaker, film history buff at all, but I haven't seen Blair Witch. Again, I need to see it. I haven't seen Evil Dead 1 or 2 or any of those either. And it's just an essential horror film that I haven't consumed and analyzed yet, which is a shame. But um, one, one of the big theories is that basically the two male characters uh, were behind the murders and were actually orchestrating the entire thing and when Heather I think is the one that actually chooses to, to go out and film these events offers for the other two men boys to go with her which I think is what happens uh, they're actually going with her so they can kill her and they were behind the whole thing I mean that would make a lot of sense as well because who goes you know oh by the way there's like a bunch of really sketchy shit going on and uh it's like got to do with witches and supernatural shit who goes oh uh, okay yeah i'm just gonna risk my life doing that and in the woods by the way in the woods not in like you know a, a landmark location where you can go out oh, there over by the windmill uh the haunted windmill no it's the woods you can get fucking lost there easily so it would make a lot of sense um uh, but the only thing about it is that the filmmakers daniel merrick and eduardo sanchez have actually you know confirmed that the supernatural elements are real like they're they are the core of the film right they are actual events that happen they're not these these orchestrated sort of mysterio-esque fucking scarecrow nightmare fucking thing so that basically denotes the whole thing uh which is a shame you know it's kind of a shame when filmmakers do that i'd rather them just not say anything and just leave it up to interpretation quite frankly because it kind of takes away the fun of the analysis of the film especially in terms of story in terms of motivate character motivations that are, may may have holes in them not that they do in these films by the way but yeah, it's kind of a shame. Drag Me to Hell represents Christine's eating disorder. So because of the sort of monstrous nature of the antagonism within the realms of this film, people think that the curse, which is that antagonistic force, is a metaphor for an eating disorder. I love when horror films, you know, Midsummer Hereditary, a uh, lot of just there's so many films, even Bo is Afraid more recently, they represent the more horrific sides of humanity rather than the outside world or other things that we can't explain and our innermost selves and our innermost demons, I think, uh, and disorders and, and troubles and issues with ourselves. Uh, I, I think it's a amazing avenue to push those ideas out there and to also you know expose people to those things like eating disorders which people don't talk about enough and i think with you know shit shot tiktok and shitstagram and uh face twat uh you know all those shitty platforms even youtube's a fucking shit show fuck you youtube you cunts by the way just have to start to <laughs> that in there. Just, you know, it's especially needed. And you might say, well, it was needed in the 50s and the 60s. It was too. It was too need needed then as well. I'm not doubting that. But right now with the amount of, you know, comparisons everyone is making to others' bodies and to others' lives, 
it's important to highlight those things and i think horror does it really well because it's horror it's so shocking that it really sticks in your mind as opposed to you know mumblecore which i'm not saying it doesn't with lots of mumblecore films and lots of uh you know french new wave films even that some of them are the slower ones i'm not saying that but it just really makes the layman and the casual film goer sort of jump out of their seats a bit more and and, and for makes them makes it stick in their head more i think because of that sh that horrific aspect to it but yeah i think once you dive into it more which i haven't just for time's sake it becomes more apparent and and interesting and obviously i'm more prone to to cover things that i love more and give that more airtime obviously so i apologize for that but this one is still very interesting and i think even just the most base main things associated with the theory and the evidence for the theory just stand out on their own you know sandy is dead in greece another film i haven't seen that's like three in a row i think yeah drag me to hell blair witch sandy is dead yeah there's three in a row but the next one is uh one that i personally added so it's sort of I'm just bouncing out a bit um so basically, this theory says that at the beginning, uh, well, actually, there's two, I think there are actually two scenes or two things, two theories representing this, but I'll just cover this one. Um, at the end of the film, when Sandy and Danny drive into the sky in a flying car, people think that they died, basically. Uh, because of the fantastical nature of it, it's it basically people believe it represents a journey to the afterlife uh which there is another theory that's kind of kind of about that that i actually haven't written into the tiers yet but it will be in probably next few tiers well it has to be in the next few tiers but probably tier five or tier four uh i won't give away what film it is but i love when uh people interpret it that way because mortality is a very interesting subject for me so if you sort of look at that and you analyze the fact that this fantastical journey can represent that as well as the, the sort of physical representation of soaring up into the sky, uh, almost up into heaven, uh, you, you can really dive deep into to more interpretations of that as well as apparently the lyrics in the song you're the one that i want are analyzed for phrases like you better shape up which some argue could be uh, evidence of purgatory or self-improvement uh, after death or perhaps rebirth i love that word rebirth it's so cool it's based on symbolic interpretations obviously this theory so we all know how easy it is to sort of speculate about symbolic interpretations as opposed to hard facts and evidence but that goes for most things in life to be to be quite honest and it kind of takes the fun away just talking about that and chat chat gpt keeps saying that for because i've got basically evidence and then counter argument it keeps saying that and i'm just like mate you know i get it but just kind of taking the fun out of it kubrick characters are aware they're in a film we've all seen kubrick films and we all know the kubrick stare his inclusion of fourth wall breaking looks at the camera as well as, you know, a lot of narration, for example, Clockwork Orange. Now, this could simply be a technique that Kubrick uses that he's implemented for, you know, either uh, a theory of if that would affect the audience in a certain way or just simply experimenting with his filmmaking and filmmaking style. But it could also mean that characters like jack from the shining which i know we've we we're definitely going to talk a lot about the shining uh throughout this uh iceberg chart just because it's rife with just so many things it's just such a such a layered film and it's so there's so much in there but you, that could be interpreted th that sort of fourth wall breaking looking at the camera i'm looking at the camera right now it's a bit meta isn't it uh it it could represent you know, I and I think this works the most with Jack because his spatial warping, for example, uh, of him just being able to completely leave the pantry uh, with no explanation. You might say, "Oh well, Danny did it." We all know, blah blah blah, right? And I, I I'm with you, and you know, I, I totally get that. Uh, but the the 
his spatial warping and his sort of his sort of unbothered nature would make you think that he's some sort of higher being that's aware that he's in a film and also aware that there can be no harm done to him because he's the main character which i would argue he is in the shining uh and also things like uh, it's quite similar with a clockwork orange in a clockwork orange you know alex does all this horrible stuff and he even fights a rival gang but they just don't care they're just like fucking about they're singing in the bath singing in the rain they're like doing what they want to people which is absolutely horrible and even in jail he doesn't really give a fuck like there's just not much emotion or reflection or you know um fear within these characters and that just could be the way kubrick writes his characters and a reflection of the human condition or a metaphor for you know uh these kinds of people or meaning or so just something anything else studies that maybe he's done but it's interesting to think that perhaps it's because they know uh that they're in a film and again the narration in a clockwork orange that could easily that could basically be him telling like the audience this like that represents another plane of existence where he can basically reach out to his own film that he's in and narrate it if that makes sense uh without kubrick's like consent <laughs> you know what i mean like deadpool basically you know stuff like that so when you watch a kubrick film think about that but obviously it could easily be Kubrick just sort of trolling us because he likes to fuck with people and he likes to fuck with the audience and he likes to really unsettle them and that just could simply be especially in The Shining the 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 stares that are completely uh unexplained within the the guise of the film it could simply just be a method and it could simply just be there just to fucking creep us out uh, which is probably the case but we all know how you know in depth everything and how meaningful everything is within a kubrick film everything has a purpose right okay so that is tier three completely finished i just want to say sorry for the shit quality of this video you know jumping about a lot uh the light not being on for most of it paul i apologize for that i am filming tier four now so that's something to look forward to and a better quality because i mean the lights hopefully you're not gonna fucking die and we'll have a much better quality video for a tier four but and there's a lot it was really 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 getting to the better theories and more obscure theories not that the other ones haven't been but um yeah thank you guys so much again i uh, hope you enjoyed the video hope you enjoyed the theories the thoughts uh you know the ideas of the theories and uh, thank you again. I'll see you out there, neon hunting peeps.